Hi, Subham. Hello. Yeah, hi. Hi, I'm Yogi Joshi. By the way, I also did my postdoc from Queen's University. I mean, oh. it was Belfast. Okay. So Francis Kiran is also there now? Yeah, he's retired now, but I see him every now and then. Uh, and Kanti Agrawal also comes there? Uh, Kanti Agarwal as well. So Kanti, I, I hadn't seen him for a long time because I think during COVID, he had gone to his daughter's place. Okay, okay. But yeah, yeah otherwise, yeah, he's also there. Okay, okay, great, great. Fine. Okay, so I think we can start. So hello everyone, welcome to our weekly seminar series, uh, celebrating India's 75 years of India's independence, Ajadi Kamrit Mahotso. So we are happy to have Dr. Shubham Srivastava with us. Uh, Shubham did his PhD from Indian Institute of Astrophysics under the supervision of uh, Professor G.C. Anupma. And he worked on novae and supernovae, optical transients and all. We both are batchmates. So, uh, and after his PhD, uh, Subham first went to IIT Bombay, where uh, for for about an year, where he was uh, with the, I I think he in the group of Varun Bhalerao working in the India Growth Collaboration, and later uh, he joined uh, Queen's University Belfast at in uh, United Kingdom as a research fellow, where he is continuing this position. Uh, other than research, uh, I, I will tell that uh, Shubham uh, likes doing bird photography and he plays flute, guitar, or whatever instrument you will give, he, he knows how to play that. Okay. And other than that, uh, we played lots of cricket, volleyball, badminton, you name it. Okay. So with this introduction, welcome Shubham to our weekly seminar series. Uh, your talk will be of say 45 minute duration and I will remind you say around 40 minutes from now. So okay. you may start now, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Vedehi. Uh, thanks uh, to Vedehi and to Aries for in inviting me on this occasion of 75 years of independence. Uh, so the title of my talk is very generic because at the time that I agreed to give the talk, I wasn't really sure what I would cover. So I've titled the talk as Faint and Fast Transients in the Local Universe. Hopefully, I'll be able to give you a flavor of some of the uh, interesting transients that uh, wide field surveys have recently uncovered. So uh, first, uh, start off with uh, uh, some stats on transients. Um, so this is a plot of uh, the number of transients that were reported to the transient name server. That is the official uh, IAU uh, body that uh, does the nomenclature, gives the names to the transients. So, uh, well, first of all, it's pretty obvious that the number of transients we are reporting each year is increasing. And there was a big jump from 2018 to 2019, and this was because of uh, ZTF. Uh, this wiki transient, transient facility, which has been prolific in discovering transients. And um, I've also put in the projected numbers for 2022 based on the current numbers. And you'll notice that the numbers for 2022 are slightly lower than the last two years. 
And I think the reason for that is that ZTF has been down for, for a good part of this year. So I think that explains it. Uh, so the blue is the total number of transients, but I also plotted uh, in the orange, uh, the classified transients. So these are the transients that somebody actually got a classification spectrum and got a type like a supernova type or a CB or a tidal disruption event or so on. And we've roughly been classifying 10% of these transients. So uh, the number hasn't changed much. In 2016, it was around 10%, and in 2021, it was similar. But because the total number of transients being discovered is increasing every year, the number of unclassified transients is also going to increase, even if we maintain this 10% number. And so all those classification surveys have stepped up as well from 2019, as you can see. Uh, this is a big challenge and this is going to be even uh, more difficult uh, when LSST comes on online, uh, the legacy survey of space and time, and that's uh, going to increase the total number of transients discovered by roughly two orders of magnitude. So this is the plot showing the projected number of discoveries when LSST comes online. So now LSST is expected to discover a million transients uh, on a yearly basis. And so here I've actually plotted in a log uh, Y axis to, to make it uh, clear. And so this really highlights the problem that we have of, uh, uh, so the, the holy grail of course of transient science is discovery, classification and follow up. So we are doing great on the discovery aspect, uh, but the classification and the follow-up is going to be a challenge, especially in the LSST era. And we need to come up with uh, more clever methods like photometric classification, for example, to uh, classify the bulk of transients. And we also need uh, new and clever methods to identify increase, uh, interesting transients uh, and then prioritize them for real-time follow-up. So uh, this is a, a pie chart of uh, the total number of transients reported to TNS between 2020 and 21, so the uh, last two years. So the total number of events around 45,000 of which uh, ZTF I discovered around 40%, so a large chunk of the objects. Atlas and Panstar surveys together account for another 40%, and Gaia reported around 13%, and the rest by the others. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, with the uh, supernova area, uh, this is a, uh, something that you might have seen before. It's a, a classification scheme for supernovae. Uh, so roughly speaking, you can think of this as um, uh, based on the spectroscopic features, we classify and we give an empirical classification to supernovae uh, broadly type 2 and type 1 based on the presence or absence of hydrogen. Uh, there are additional layers of classification uh, that can be added based on the light curve characteristics. So if you, for example, if there's a type 2 and we see a plateau in the light curve, we call it a type 2p and so on. There are also additional uh, layers based on the uh, features, the, the spectral features. For example, once the broad lines show very broad features due to the high expansion velocities, and you have type 2N, uh, where the N stands for narrow emission, and this is because of circumstellar interaction and so on. So uh, I also wanted to highlight something that most of you would have already seen, I'm sure. This is the Klinova of 2017-2017 GFO. It was the first uh, event that uh, gravitational wave event, a binary neutron star merger event that was also detected across the electromagnetic spectrum from, from radio to gamma rays. And these objects, um, this was a dramatic confirmation of uh, the fact that uh, short gamma ray bursts come from neutron star mergers. And these are also sites of the R process. The, the kilonova, which stands for the optical infrared display produced by this merger, uh, it produces uh, because uh, the R process nucleosynthesis uh, produces features of lanthanides, for example, in the spectra. 
and that, that is what powers the optical infrared light curve. So uh, in the last uh, observing run of LIGO, which started in 2019, uh, which was 03, 2019 to, uh, which was suspended in 2020, um, around this year, last, uh, around this year, around this time, uh, we did not see another one of these uh, kilonovi. Uh, so this is the only one that is done so far. And uh, the revised rates for these events uh, are now much lower. So these are much rarer than we uh, used to think. So uh, next I'm going to talk about a little bit about the Atlas survey. So here at Queens, I am involved with the Atlas survey and it's a collaboration between uh, Hawaii and Queens and uh, the Atlas survey uh, consists of uh, four uh, 50 centimeter telescope units with a 30 square degree field of view. These are uh, two of these units are in Hawaii and now recently installed uh, units uh, in Chile and South Africa. And uh, the typical depth of these uh, of the survey is around 19 and a half magnitude for a 30 second exposure. Now the primary funding for Atlas is for near-Earth objects, uh, it's funded by NASA for the detection and uh, alert, alerting uh, the community of any potential hazardous uh, near-Earth objects. And so the, uh, the survey is designed to optimize the detection of these uh, moving, moving objects like uh, near-Earth objects and asteroids and so on. So uh, the survey essentially uh, obtains a quad of images at a location every night. So we make four visits of a field every night to optimize the detection of uh, movers. And the typical depth of these images is at least varies between 19 to 20 magnitude every night. And the, the images are obtained in primarily two filters. These are the broadband orange and cyan filters. Uh, roughly equivalent to the R and I, R plus I. So orange is uh, roughly equivalent to R plus I and cyan is roughly G plus R. Uh, since the uh, uh, southern units in Chile and South Africa came online earlier uh, this year, we get we are getting nightly cadence in the regions that are common. So only in the polar regions, we still have a cadence of two days. Uh, but uh, for the rest of the sky, we have a nightly cadence. So Atlas, uh, one of the units will observe uh, the part of the sky every night. So uh, although uh, the primary goal of the survey is, of course, moving objects, uh, this is great for transients. Uh, and we at Queens here, we use the Atlas data. Once the moving objects have been filtered out by the asteroid community, we use the images to produce stationary transients. And the way we do that is uh, with the help of uh, the, the Atlas Transient Science Server. So, um, also the PanStars telescope. So, uh, the PanStars 1 and 2 telescopes are also uh, located in Hawaii. These are 1.8 meter telescopes and uh, they have a large field of view of uh, that use uh, these 1.3 gigapixel cameras. And uh, so the currently the PanStars is also funded for a NEO survey, a near earth object survey. And we process the, uh, we process the stationary transients from these images in a similar manner at Queens. So the data is transferred from Hawaii to Belfast every day, both for Atlas and PanStars. And uh, so here I briefly explain the Atlas uh, transient science server. So this is what we do with the data after it arrives at Queens. And this is explained in Ken Smith's paper that came out in 2020. So, um, so the first step is producing the difference images. So we have a reference, uh, we have a target image every night, and that's that's the image that was obtained on the night. We also have a stack reference of the same area of sky, uh, which is basically based on a stack of all previous images of that area, 
and then we do a difference imaging to detect uh, any anything new that has popped up now this difference images uh, all the sources are extracted on this difference image and so the first number that you see is roughly 10 million is the total number of detections on the difference images so that's a very large number and most of it is actually artifacts of difference imaging so uh, most of them, as you see, are single detections. Now remember that Atlas observes a quad of images or four images of the same part of the sky every night. But most of the detections that we get are actually single objects. So these are mostly noise or some kind of uh, streaks due to, or uh, streaks due to bright stars and so on. So these are removed. And then, then we ask, OK, uh, do we have three or more detections uh, for the same object that are spatially coincident, so in the same location. And uh, once we have at least three uh, detections, good quality, that is five sigma detections on a given location, uh, roughly uh, once we make that quality cut, only around 10,000 pass through. So we reject around a good part of the number uh, with this quality cut. Uh, after this, known stars and AGN uh, are removed uh, based on existing catalogs, and this brings down the number to around uh, 100,000. And we also do a moving object check. We match all these detections with uh, ephemeris catalogs of uh, known asteroids and comets, and uh, eventually, a machine learning algorithm is run, which has been trained to detect spikes and uh, noise artifacts of difference imaging. So eventually, at the end, roughly a few hundred uh, objects uh, survive. And these few hundred detections eventually enter the database. And these are then looked at by a human scanner. So there's a, uh, there's a human step involved, the last step, uh, where a few hundred objects so, uh, a human scanner would go through go through these a few hundred objects uh, on a nightly basis, and eventually, on a good night, we get a few tens of real transients in the data stream. So, on a good night, we would end up promoting around a few tens of objects to the transient name server. Uh, this is uh, an example of the data that we get from Atlas. So, here you have three supernovae that were discovered by Atlas. And you have, I've shown here triplets of the target image, which has the supernova, the reference image uh, that is used for the subtraction, and finally, the difference image. Uh, here, I'd also like to advertise the Atlas Force Photometry Server. Now, all Atlas data are public through the Force Photometry Server. And uh, you can register uh, at the website that I've linked there. And you can uh, submit your requests, and you can request photometry, atlas, orange, and cyan band photometry at any location since the service started in 2016. And this is great for uh, all different kinds of science. If you're into, uh, if you're interested in supernovae and transients, you can supplement your data set with the atlas photometry. But you can also do uh, all kinds of uh, other science with this. It's great for variable stars, for example, CVs and uh, M door flares and so on. But this is uh, so the ZTF survey has been very prolific in discovering transients at Queens. Uh, Queens has involved has been involved in uh, developing the laser broker. This is a broker to process and visualize ZTF data. So laser uh, basically. Uh, ingest the ZTF data stream that is in the form of Kafka streams, and then it uh, filters uh, real transients from the data stream and also adds, uh, does a value addition uh, using a, a code that was written by uh, Dave Young, who works at, here at Queens, and he has this Sherlock code that does a context classification. So Sherlock mines all existing catalogs uh, of galaxies and AGN and variable stars and so on to come up with a likely uh, context-based classification for each transient. So for example, if the transient is in association with a galaxy nearby, it will come up with a supernova classification, uh, context classification. 
And Lasser is also great for visualizing the light curves. Um, so you can uh, look at ZTF light curves with different objects uh, using Lasser. You can also build your custom filters where you can filter uh, based on certain criteria, depending on the kind of objects you're looking for uh, in Lasser and so on. So coming to the transient landscape. Uh, so this is a plot of luminosity versus time scale. Uh, and so we have this Vane uh, supernovae over here, of course, uh, in the, and then we have uh, luminous transients um, at the uh, top end of the plot. And then you have all these other families of transients. For example, you have the novae below, and then you have the luminous red novae, and you have luminous blue variables and so on. So uh, as we get better, as the surveys get more efficient uh, in not only increasing the, uh, the footprint of the sky that is observed every night, but also the depth that we can go to, uh, the landscape of the transient, the dynamic landscape of these transients is going to get more and more uh, interesting with time and we're going to uncover more features on this landscape as we as our as our uh, surveying capabilities uh, increase and so here i have shown so as as our surveys improve we are going to discover more dots on the landscape especially on the small time scale uh, part of this parameter space. So all those transients that are very fast evolving that were probably missed by previous surveys because they didn't have the cadence or the depth. And so now we are uncovering more and more of these transients. So these, this is a family called F-BOTS, which stands for fast blue optical transients. And as the name suggests, these are very luminous, very blue, and very short-lived, very fast rise. Uh, and these transients, the true nature of these is not quite understood yet. But we do understand that they require some kind of a central engine, like an injection from a magnetar, to be able to power the very rapid rise in the high luminosities. So the best example of this is 2018 cow that was discovered in 2018. Another very interesting event that was uh, discovered with ZTF and Atlas uh, together was this event called 2018 KZR. This was not as luminous as the typical F-bot, but it was very fast evolving. And of course, you have the Kilonova, the fastest uh, transient that is known to us yet. Uh, the Kilonova is like a few day time scale. These are these occupy a luminosity range that is sort of in between supernovae and novae, and that's why the name kilonova, they're typically a thousand times brighter than a nova. And then I've also highlighted the area that I'm more interested in or maybe partial to, and that is the faint 1x uh, uh, parameter space, and so that's the luminosity and time scale regime occupied by what I call faint 1AX transients. And I'll be talking about these more in the upcoming slides. So a little bit about F-bots. So their origin is still really a mystery. 2018 cow was a very nearby event. And it was, as you can see in the spectra, it was extremely blue and very little evolution with time uh, in the temperature as well as the velocity. The velocity was also more or less constant. The light curve uh, very rapidly rising and requiring a central engine to power the light curve. Very, the nickel production was not very high and the nickel can't really explain the very fast rise and the very fast decline. So there have been different scenarios uh, that were conjectured for these, uh, for example, the electron capture from a low mass star, or you could have a failed explosion, which would involve fallback. So you have, where you have a massive star and a failed explosion that forms a black hole, and then the, the star, uh, most of the material immediately falls back onto the newly formed black hole. And then uh, there, there was also a paper that suggested a tidal disruption event origin from an intermediate mass black hole. So we don't really know uh, what these objects are, but we are discovering more of these kind of objects uh, with, that, uh, with these wide field surveys. 
2018 case scenario as well. So here in the light curve plot uh, shows you the comparison with uh, the fastest known uh, transient that we have so far, which is the Kilonova 2017 GFO, and it's quite similar. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's slightly slower declining, but not by much. So it's an extremely fast, uh, fast evolving transient, but much more more luminous than the Kilonova. At least two magnitudes uh, more luminous. The light curve again extremely rapid rise and uh, the luminosity and the rise time together need a central engine like a magnetar to explain the bolometric light curve evolution from the spectra uh, these are spectra that were modeled by james gillanders he's a phd student here at queens and what he found was that the the required ratio of iron to radioactive material was quite high. So you need a larger, a rather large fraction of Fe to nickel. And this indicates that there is stable iron in the ejector because uh, from radioactive decay, you would expect to get nickel uh, from the decay of nickel 56, you would expect to get iron 56, but that would uh, it would take some time for all the nickel to decay into that iron whereas the spectra show very strong iron from the get-go and that's uh, that that tells us that there's this stable iron at 54 fe in the ejector and this from theory this favors a merger scenario so this was likely some kind of a merger involving a white dwarf with uh, either a neutron star or, or a black hole Uh, here I also highlight the pan star search for kilonovi. So although we don't, we did not discover any kilonovi uh, in the last uh, run of LIGO, the O3 run, which was suspended uh, in March last year, but we have uh, since continued a pan star search for kilonovi. So although LIGO is not yet operational right now, we're looking, we're always looking for these kilonovi uh, that. We, uh, we could discover a kilonova uh, without the gravitational wave trigger. Uh, so it's basically an untriggered uh, kilonova search campaign. We are hoping to discover one of these serendipitously uh, based on their photometry. We know that they decline very fast. So we use the regular uh, survey operations of pan stars and these uh, the regular survey mode works uh, Similar, not very dissimilar to the Atlas, where you have uh, four visits of 45 seconds uh, each. And these, uh, because it's a bigger telescope, the Mansa's depth is obviously uh, it's deeper. It reaches around 21 to 22 max with each visit. And uh, based on this, we identify a, um, a transients that are associated with galaxies using the Sherlock context classification code that I talked about, uh, we identify any transients that are associated with galaxies within 200 megaparsec, because that is the limit of the distance at which we would be able to detect a GFO like Kilonova with pan stars. And uh, we identify and mark these transients that are within 200 megaparsec for further follow-up. So we request further follow-up photometry from pan stars for these uh, identified objects. And uh, this is to confirm any uh, significant fading that would be expected from a GFO kilonova light light curve. So uh, most we haven't really found any uh, untriggered uh, kilonova yet, of course. Uh, most of the objects that we see are old supernovae. And so they don't really show a declining light curve. Some of them did show a declining light curve that was promising, but they turned out to be something else. So for example, this was a 21 BXU, and this is this actually turned out to be a 2B supernova. So it turns out that the shock cooling phase of these 2Bs can decline very fast. And that, that got us really excited, but it just turned out to be a type 2B. Another uh, another one of these contaminants uh, are the, of course the CVs, the cataclysmic variables. These are all uh, foreground galactic uh, variables. This one happened to be in close association with a very nice uh, 100 megaparsec galaxy. So we were quite excited about this one, but it just turned out to be a CV in chance alignment with a background galaxy. So, uh, 
since 2020 we have completed more than a hundred of these uh, follow-ups and most of what we have found uh, were supernova candidates so either their light curves were rising or they were declining at a rate that you would expect from a supernova and uh, a handful of them were intrinsically very faint transients so interesting transients like faint type 2s uh, intermediate luminosity red transients luminous red novi luminous blue variable out, outbursts and so on few of them very few of them were slow movers that were not picked up by the by the moving object uh, algorithms in the data so these were like very slow movers background comets uh, and a few of them were likely artifacts of the subtraction because in the follow up imaging we found no trace of these objects so uh, the takeaway is that uh, there are uh, in a shock cooling phase of the type 2b supernovae and cvs and lbv outbursts these are the three primary com contaminants in any kilonova search so and these are quite common i mean 2b's are uh, reasonably common cvs are of course uh, very common although cvs do tend to be blue so if you have color information we can we can uh, probably control for that and lbb outbursts as well so these are the primary contaminants of, for any kilonova search uh, based on any untriggered search for kilonovi so now going back to the classification uh, plot that I showed you, I for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on the type 1a supernovae. So these are fundamentally different from all the other classes of objects on this plot in the sense that these are not actually core collapse. Type 1a's are due to uh, thermonuclear runaway on degenerate material that is a white dwarf. So you have uh, at least one white dwarf and you, know, you could have a binary system where you have two white dwarfs or you, have, you can have a white dwarf that is accreting matter from a donor and because of the accretion the eventually uh, the white dwarf becomes unstable as it approaches Chandrasekhar wow. and eventually there's an explosion so although we understand pretty well that a white dwarf is involved uh, the exact nature of the companion is still not really understood and it's a little bit embarrassing because we still don't know what these objects are although we use them for cosmology and uh, the expansion the accelerated expansion of the universe based on 1a cosmology uh, specifically uh, in the 1a uh, scene so although we use them for cosmology there's there's a really uh, very rich diversity in these objects so uh, most of the 1A objects that we find are called what we call as normal 1As, where they have very standard luminosity and light curve shape. So this plot is also, you can think of it as a luminosity versus time scale plot. So you have, here you have the peak uh, B-band magnitude versus what is known as a decline rate, uh, delta M15, which is a decline in the magnitude from peak to after 15 days of peak. And so you have the normal supernovae clustered very nicely, and then you have the uh, line, the black line that is basically the Phillips relationship, and this is the width luminosity relationship that allows these objects to be used as standardizable candles. But then we also have families of objects around the normal distribution that are that are that don't necessarily show the width luminosity relationships. So on the brighter end, you have uh, the CSM 1As. These are 1As that have signatures of circumstellar material. And they tend to be much brighter than normal 1As and also much slower evolving. You also have the Super Chandrasekhar 1A candidates. And these are very luminous. And so we believe that you need more than a Chandrasekhar mass to be able to produce that kind of luminosity. And then you also have uh, some weird objects that uh, are not uh, that faint, but then their decline rates are sort of comparable to normal uh, 1As. And then we have the, uh, the 1AX family that I'll be talking more about. And then we also have some gap transients. Like these are known as calcium rich or calcium strong transients. 
and um, these sort of occupy an intermediate luminosity range between uh, supernovae and novae again. So that's why we call them gap transients. So uh, this, uh, this is just a snapshot of the diversity and also to highlight some of the work that has been done at Aries and IA over the years. And so here I have a normal 1A, uh, which is SN 2003DU, a transitional 1A 15BP, a super Chandrasekhar 1A candidate uh, 2012 DN. And then we have these three 1A Xs, uh, which is, uh, for example, 5HK, 14DT, and 20SCK. Uh, so uh, I'll be focusing on these 1A Xs for the remainder of the talk. So 1A X supernovae, these are uh, essentially low luminosity, low velocity cousins of type 1As. And so they have a wide range in luminosity, but typically the luminosities are lower than normal supernovae, normal one is. And the ejector velocities are consistently lower than what we see for normal one is. In typical uh, normal supernovae, we would see ejector velocities of more than 10,000 kilometers a second, and they are consistently lower in 1AX. Another interesting thing about these is that the late phase spectra do not do show a true nebular nature, even very late spectra, like a year or two after the explosion, still shows uh, permitted features, especially permitted ion features in the spectrum. And unlike uh, normal one is that, that are mostly uh, almost entirely for middle lines at, at, at those kind of nebular phases. Also in the late time, uh, we see a flattening in the light curves. So the light curves tend to be in, at late times more luminous than you would expect from the radioactive decay. And another interesting thing about these objects are they tend to favor or prefer young stellar populations. Uh, when you compare them to the distribution of normal one is, these tend to uh, favor younger stellar populations, more akin to the core collapse uh, population, for example. And also the rates, the volumetric rates of these objects, uh, which is an important diagnostic for binary population synthesis calculations, for example. Uh, so any model would not only be able to predict, uh, any good model would not only be able to predict for example, the distribution of luminosity, but also the volumetric rates that you would expect to see. Uh, and so uh, coming to the progenitors of 1AX, uh, again, we don't really know what these are. Uh, the prevailing idea is that uh, these are weak explosions, which is evidenced by the fact that the, the, uh, the ejector velocities are small. and so we now believe that because of these weak explosions, the wide dwarf, uh, the explosion energy is insufficient to completely unbind the progenitor wide dwarf. And that leaves what we call as a bound remnant. So part of the wide dwarf is still bound and then it, it basically just uh, remains after the explosion. And the short delay times that, that we talked about in the previous slide, that is the, the fact that they favor young stellar populations indicate that the delay times of these progenitors are short. The delay time is essentially the time from star formation to the actual explosion. So because they are found in younger stellar populations, that implies that the progenitors have shorter delay times. And the delay times have been constrained to roughly uh, 100 mega years for, for these 1A X uh, explosions. So uh, a promising scenario for these objects uh, is that these are uh, the progenitors are what are known as these hybrid carbon oxygen neon white dwarfs. So for the normal one is um, we believe that the progenitors are carbon oxygen white dwarfs, but for these 1A Xs, it seems that a good candidate is the a hybrid carbon oxygen neon white dwarf where you have a oxygen neon mantle and a carbon oxygen core. 
Now, there are also the simulations suggest that these uh, cone white dwarfs, C-O-N-E white dwarfs can be more massive at formation. And they can be as much as 1.2 or 1.3 solar mass at formation. And this is interesting because this will help explain the short delay times. If your progenitor white dwarf is already very massive, that implies that it needs less time to accrete the necessary material to become unstable to reach Chandrasekhar limit. And that would help explain the short delay times. The other uh, interesting aspect of uh, these uh, CONE white dwarf is that simulations show that when the companion of the CONE white dwarf is a helium rich companion, the delay time uh, distribution tends to be much shorter. So if the CONE white dwarf is accreting from a helium rich donor, then the delay times uh, tend to be much shorter as opposed to be uh, accreting from a hydrogen rich donor, as you can see in the plot there. And so uh, this scenario involving a CONE white dwarf and a helium rich donor seems to be very promising for 1AX. So uh, these are uh, two faint 1AX uh, supernovae that were discovered recently by the Atlas survey. I have here the triplets, the target reference and difference images for the discovery for Atlas. So these were both objects that were identified in real time. And then we got a classification and then we prioritize, prioritize them for follow-up. So uh, in terms of the photometric properties, uh, I have defined these faint 1AX class as uh, the family that is fainter than around minus 16. Now, there is no real uh, basis for the minus 16 delineation, but it's mostly uh, it's kind of arbitrary, but it still helps in, in order to classify. And so uh, this is a plot that shows the normal one is clustered around minus 19. So you have peak luminosity on the y-axis and a decline rate on the x-axis here. And so, of course, the, one, the normal one is in black are mostly clustered around minus 19. And then and rest, the rest of the objects are all 1AX objects. And so, as you can see, I mean, there's a very large diversity. Uh, they're all over the place from minus 13 to minus 19. And the ones highlighted in magenta are the ones that are part of the Atlas local volume survey, which I'll be talking about. But these, this is the sample of uh, transients that, uh, that we use to constrain the volumetric rates of these, uh, this class of object. And so only two of these, that is 19 GSC and 20 KYG actually lie below the minus 16 threshold. And uh, we classify them as faint 1AX. The other known members of this class or the faint 1AX category are 2010A, 2008HA, and the recently discovered 21FCG, which uh, seems to be the faintest yet that we know of. In terms of the bolometric light curve, uh, again, um, they tend to be uh, obviously less luminous. So in comparison, I have the more luminous 2005 HK plotted in the orange over here. And uh, I also have uh, uh, the evolution of the, the black body temperature. So the bolometric luminosity was estimated with a black body SED fit to the photometry. And based on that, I have a black body temperature evolution in the bottom panel. And although the luminosities of is there's a wide range the temperatures actually seem to be very consistent so the temperatures are very uh, consistent for the bright and the faint 1x objects and i also have an, uh, a relative contribution of optical uv and infrared evolution for uh, for 20 kyg here uh, so in terms of the explosion parameters so here I have a plot of uh, ejecta mass inferred. And so these are all explosion param parameters that are inferred from the volumetric light curve fits, fit an analytical uh, energy deposition model to the volumetric light curve and infer these uh, explosion parameters. So on the y-axis, we have uh, the nickel mass, which is a proxy for the luminosity. And on the x-axis, we have the ejecta mass. 
that is that to the first order controls the shape of the light curve or the width of the light curve. So you can think of this also as a luminosity versus time scale parameter space. And uh, so the, the 1ax events again are highlighted in the magenta. And so uh, now the uh, I've also shown here uh, what uh, in the plus sign, in the red plus sign is uh, predictions from theoretical models of uh, Chandrasekhar mass deflagrations, 3D simulations of these deflagrations. And so uh, you'll immediately notice that the uh, luminosity of the theoretical predictions seem to be in the right ballpark for the faint 1ax, but their ejecta masses are an order of magnitude lower. So although these models can produce the low luminosity that we see in faint 1ax, uh, their ejecta mass tends to be uh, much lower than what is inferred from the observations. And this leads to a very uh, rapid uh, predicted decline rate as opposed to the observed decline rate. So this is something that uh, perhaps more exploration of the parameter space is needed from the theoretical perspective as well. Uh, spectroscopic modeling. Uh, so here I've modeled a spectra with, uh, with a 1D radiative transfer code called TARDIS. And trans, uh, TARDIS basically uh, assumes a composition and a density, a profile and abundance profile that the user can supply. And it assumes a sharp black body emitting photosphere and everything that is the ejector uh, is basically the region above this uh, sharp photosphere. And so uh, to the first order uniform abundance uh, does a reasonable job of reproducing these spectra. And from, from the models as well, you would expect the ejector to be uniformly mixed because uh, the deflagration, the pure deflagration uh, predicts very turbulent ejecta that is uniformly mixed. So the fact that we get a decent fit uh, with a uniform abundance profile is encouraging from, uh, from a deflagration standpoint. So the model is composed mostly of carbon, oxygen, silicon, and again, so that that also tells us that although these objects are very faint, but they have in connection with the broad uh, 1A family. And um, so I'll briefly, uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do for this is to constrain the volumetric rates of faint 1A supernovae. And to be able to do this, uh, we have put together what we call as the Atlas Local Volume Survey. So this is a survey of uh, all the or the sample of transients that Atlas has observed that are uh, that are associated with galaxies within 100 megaparsec that corresponds to roughly a redshift of 0.025. So we uh, using the, our shared law context classification, we identify all transients that are associated with host galaxies within this redshift. We also include transients that have a classification on the TNS. So uh, they have a classification where this redshift falls uh, below our threshold, but their host galaxy may not have had a classification, but the transient redshift is within our cutoff. Uh, and then we closely inspect every single object in the sample to remove any transients that might have an incorrect galaxy association that I'll show you in a second. And we also remove objects that were likely foreground, like a CV or end or flares, for example. This, these can be identified by a closer inspection of the pan stars uh, image of the field. And so if there's a pre-existing source, for example, uh, we can usually identify them as contaminants. And finally, we also salvage transients that were registered on the transient name server by the service, but they ended up in, the, in our garbage list. Uh, now this can happen either due to human error because there is a human uh, step involved in identifying these transients. And so sometimes the human scanner can reject uh, a good supernova and put it in the garbage. 
and sometimes uh, if it's a very young supernova that is on the that has been detected pretty much at the limiting magnitude or it's as a marginal detection sometimes the machine learning can give it a low score which is why it can get rejected so these transients were recovered now this is an example of an incorrect association so initially sherlock identified this transient with uh, the 100 megaparsec galaxy that you see on the left but a closer inspection of the stamp of the uh, pan stars a stamp shows that there's a faint uh, extended source close to the transient and that is that one is probably the true host galaxy which is probably a background host so this is not not really a 100 megaparsec object there are also objects like these yeah so maybe 5 6 more minutes okay yeah there are also objects like this one that that are more tricky because this one does not really have a visible uh, background host galaxy but when we took a spectrum it turned out to be a background 1a at around a redshift of 0.1 and these are kind of objects are harder to reject because we need a spectrum to be able to uh, exclude them from a sample so uh I'll skip uh, through this slide. It's basically the efficiency of recovery in the simulation. So we ran a simulation for our survey and then estimated how efficient the survey is at detecting uh, different kinds of transients. And this is something we need to be able to estimate the volumetric rates. So uh, this is basically the summary of the local volume survey. We have roughly 900 transients for a three and a half year span. and around 30% are 1a's uh, 40% type 2's um 16% are unclassified so this tells us that even the uh, the nearest transients within the local volume there's still like roughly 1 in 6 that end up without a classification so the take away is that the faint 1x volumetric rate that we constraint that we get from this uh, analysis is roughly 15% there's there's a large uncertainty on the rate because uh, the sample only includes 6 1ax events so out of those 899 events only 6 are 1ax and only 2 are these faint 1ax and so as we uh, discover more of these objects the constraints on the rates are going to improve so finally uh, i'll end with the carbon oxygen neon model as the most promising for the faint 1ax and now there's a uh, significant observational evidence for a helium rich companion this is a work done by mccully et al and this is the hst a pre explosion image of a 1ax supernova 2012z and there's there's evidence of a faint of a blue source in pre explosion images and this tells us that uh, the and this has been identified as a companion or as a donor to the white dwarf and it has been identified as a likely helium rich star or a helium donor and so this is consistent with uh, the carbon oxygen neon white dwarf for creating uh, from a helium rich donor scenario so basically you have the co any white dwarf for carbon oxygen core surrounded by an oxygen neon man mantle and the mantle will also quench the deflagration so that also implies that the, the the explosion would not be as energetic and luminous as you would expect in a normal uh, explosion and so that's the constraint on the volumetric rates from atlas and this is consistent with uh, binary population synthesis uh, estimates that range from 1 to 18% of the 1a rate so this is 15% of the 1a rate so that's relative to the uh, 1a rate in the local universe and the short delay time uh, that has been seen for 1ax supernovae is consistent with uh, a scenario where they are accreting from a helium rich donor as we saw previously and so so now the question is how do we explain uh, the spectra so for example the, uh, we don't really see true nebular spectra at late times and also we see a flattening in the late time light curves so both these observational uh, aspects can be uh, explained by the presence of a bound remnant a bound remnant that has been enriched with the ashes of the deflagration uh, can potentially contribute to the late time photometry and therefore uh, 
leading to this late time flattening in the light curve and it can also help explain the persistent presence of permitted lines in the late spectra and also interestingly for the faint 1ax supernovae the ejecta mass uh, inferred from the from the modeling the bolometric light curves is very small so it's a few tenth of solar mass and that implies that a bulk of the white dwarf uh, would become uh, basically the bound remnant so you would have a very massive bound remnant for the faint 1ax objects and this bound remnant in principle could be detectable and also another interesting aspect is that if the companion uh, is not given a large kick and if the binary system survives and so you still have a companion a donor and you still have this massive bound remnant so there's a possibility that these could be even recurring so i'll stop here and uh, happy to take any questions okay thank you so much for a very informative presentation summarizing the latest updates in this optical transient field so now we have uh, some time for question comments from the audience so i encourage directly you can unmute yourself and ask the question or raise the hand then i will invite you please go ahead yes anirban please unmute yourself and ask yeah uh, so a very interesting talk and uh, i was mostly interested in the modeling of 2018 kzr which you showed initially so uh, you mentioned that uh, because uh, the explosion time is uh, lesser so you say that uh, it's mostly because nickel 56 uh, to iron 56 is lesser than the decay time of 56 nickel to 56 iron so it is, should be it should be stable iron uh, I was wondering, like, how did you say with Tardis that, uh, like, it is 56 nickel, uh, it is 56 iron or 54 iron because uh, uh, Tardis does not take into account anything, any decay chain or something like that. It just assumes a black body. So how did you say, like, uh, is, is it based on just uh, the ratio of iron or uh, nickel to cobalt used in the modeling or how is it like? Uh, no, you're right. So TARDIS by itself cannot distinguish between stable iron and 56 Fe and 54 Fe, but the inference is essentially from uh, the fact that iron is very strong. So the spectrum requires a lot of iron. So even the earliest spectrum requires a lot of iron, whereas there's very little co uh, signatures of cobalt and nickel. Uh, so, I mean, so it's, a, it's so the inference is that uh, there's there's already a lot of iron present in the ejector before the radioactive uh, nickel ha has had a chance to decay into cobalt and then to iron. So the implication being, uh, because 56 Fe, you would only expect uh, to see as a result of the nucleosynthesis, whereas you would expect the ejector to have some amount of a stable 54 iron. So that that's basically, uh, that's that's the inference. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Any other question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Kuntal. Aisa, you have unmuted. Please. Hi, Shubham. Hi. Uh, hey. uh, I just wanted to know about uh, the Panster's... Uh, survey where you had mentioned that they're also trying to identify the or locate the kilonovae between 21 to 22 magnitude yeah. in yeah. the alpha. So has there been any success in that? Uh, not really. So I mean, we haven't really found any kilonovae, but uh, we have found uh, the kind of objects that usually end up contaminating. So and uh, Perhaps if we can rule out these objects, uh, so we understand more. So, for example, we found a lot of LBV outbursts, and these can be very fast declining for short periods of these outbursts. So, uh, so yes, we haven't really found any kilonovae, but we have have a better understanding of the contaminants that will hopefully help us in identifying uh, real uh, real candidates in the future. Okay. And when you are performing this uh, search, so uh, this uh, 
exposure time for each of the image is like 45 seconds yeah but to identify like i mean kilonovae are uh, much fainter than 21 to 22 magnitude so do you really stack these images and try to go down deeper yeah we do do a stack so uh, typically we have four to six exposures on a location so if you tag uh, stack four exposures for example you you get a improvement by a factor of 2 so uh but uh, but the 22 uh, so that's why we only stick to transients that are within 200 megaparsec because a uh, 2017 g gfo like transient at 200 megaparsec will would be pretty much at the limit of that 22 man so that's why we don't really uh, prioritize objects uh, beyond that distance for follow up thank you okay yeah professor anupma please unmute yourself and ask the question Yeah, hi Shubham. Hi, hi ma'am. Nice talk. So you, um, you know, talked about the possibility of uh, the progenitor for the faint one A axis, yeah, cone white dwarf and a helium donor. Yeah. Uh, this probably doesn't quite explain the brighter ones, right? So what are the possible progenitors for the brighter one A axis? Well, I mean, it, I, I suppose. because it could explain the brighter ones as well because the the only one where we have pre explosion Im- imaging is 2012z and that is a bright one ax and uh, the the faint blue source in the pre explosion images i think there's good reasons to believe that it's a helium rich donor mm-hmm. so it seems that uh, it it could explain the only difference would be in the mass of the bound remnant depending on how luminous the one ax was so for example in a bright 1ax the ejecta mass would be larger which means the bound remnant would have a smaller mass mm. whereas in the faintest 1ax uh, the ejecta mass would be small which is which means that most of the material would be left over in the bound remnant so i think that's the only real difference so okay so i think because of that the the faint 1ax Uh, bound remnants have actually a higher chance of being detected in the future because they are more massive yeah right yeah and probably they have a higher chance of being recurrent also if at all yeah yeah and that that is if it's a, if, if there's a kick for example and the companion may not stay bound uh, we don't really know what's going to happen but if the companion if the binary companion stays uh, Uh, then yes, I, there's a good chance they could be recurrent as well. Yeah, and maybe eventually they might, for all you know, end up to be like a normal type one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Subham. Yeah, uh, Subham. Go ahead. Nice. Subindo, go ahead. Yeah, nice talk. Um, so I have a, a naive question. So uh, yeah. during this, uh, let's say, survey, you detect many of the. other kind of transient like tds so uh, without spectroscopy how do you distinguish them or uh, do you need ex- absolutely the spectroscopy uh, yeah yeah we we need spectroscopy as of now so the plot that i had uh, so uh, roughly uh, 16% of the sample are unclassified so those are all uh, objects that we don't have a classification for so so yeah the short answer is we can't i mean we we are trying to come up with ways to classify using photometry mm-hmm. but that's that that that's challenging and still not quite there yet okay. so other classification are mostly based on the spectroscopy right yeah mm-hmm. so okay. like normal one is you can do pretty well with photometric classification but Yeah, it's it's still a challenge. So, Subham, do you have like you you run your own uh, spectroscopic follow up campaign? Also means like as a part of this uh, Atlas survey. So, as part of the survey, uh, so we are part of this uh, classification program called EPESTO. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, we use the three and a half meter telescope in Chile to do mm-hmm. the classification. but the queens group uh, so we also have a classification program using the liverpool telescope that is at la palma okay so liverpool. you see yeah okay good good thanks 
Okay. Any other questions or comment from the audience? If not, so let us thank once again to Shubham. Shubham, thank you once again for uh, accepting our invitation and for a very nice and informative talk. And we yeah, hope that uh, some, uh, hope we, we literally look forward that you will come back to India and then you will visit us sometime. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> and uh, I also thank everyone for joining and then we will see you next week. Next Thanks. time. Okay. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.